Yo guys, we are back for another episode of the Great Ace Attorney Reviews. Today we'll be looking at the second episode, The Adventure of the Unbreakable Speckled Band. This case is a very unique entry in the series. It's the only case that is solely an investigation and isn't a part of the investigation spin-off titles. The big talking point about The Great Departure was its length, and for The Speckled Band, it's the fact that there are no courtroom segments at all. Now, before I even talk about the case, I do want to say that I appreciate that the game tried this new idea. It feels so distinct from everything we've seen before, and it's because the creators took all these risks to change up the formula, so I really like the fact that they tried this out. Now, let's get into the case itself. I love the reaction to seeing Kazuma die. Both Susuto and Ryunosuke have believable reactions to their friend's death. I also love the premise. Ryunosuke stowing on the ship in a trunk and living in a closet for like 15 days is such a fun premise to me. I can only imagine the pain and suffering that journey must have been. I mean, they even describe how Ryunosuke got tossed and churned when he got into the ship via a suitcase and now he's greeted with the death of his friend. I really like what they do with Susuto's character. She's so distraught that even when Ryunosuke gives her strong evidence of his innocence, she still doesn't trust him completely. I do think it's fine that they keep Ryunosuke as a suspect here, even with some of the clues like the Russian message, because in the eyes of people like Susuto, the locked room is as equally mysterious as the locked wardrobe. I also like how she's a fresh take on the assistant character. She differentiates herself by being more aggressive and serious. She still does have some of the characteristics of a traditional assistant. For example, she's a Sherlock Holmes fangirl. She has her smart moments, but also her dumb ones, which is actually refreshing for a character. You also get to see her slowly warm to Ryunosuke as the case progresses. As she starts learning more about the case, she decides that Ryunosuke isn't the culprit and genuinely wants to help us and isn't solely investigating for Kazuma. However, she still has her rude side of her personality throughout the case which makes the dynamic between her and Ryunosuke very, very fun. I'm almost inclined to say that this is the best protag assistant dynamic in a single case. Sherlock Holmes also makes a good first introduction. It's funny when he's first placed upside down on Kazuma's desk, then makes his false deductions, and then forget what he says. From these characters, we already have a fun dynamic throughout the case. Sherlock makes dumb deductions at Ryunosuke's expense, Susuto agrees with Herlock's deductions, being the fangirl that she is, and gets heated at Ryunosuke, and then Ryunosuke gets mad at both of them. The dynamic also develops when Susuto starts to get hypocritical when she allows Holmes to read Cosmo's diary, but not Ryunosuke, which again, is quite entertaining. Now, let's talk about the new mechanic, the dance of deduction. It's a fun mechanic because it's fresh. This is the first time we see it, so the presentation will take you in. Also, the false deductions are funny, and the reactions to it from Ryunosuke and Susuto are equally entertaining. Now, there is something I don't think is well explained. Sometimes you have to examine objects and change the word of said object. An example is the photo of the cat. I think most people would be inclined to present it right away, but you have to examine the photo and then present it. This isn't all that bad though, because you'll only lose one penalty, and then you'll know you have to do this from now on. It does feel like the pursue mechanic, in the fact that it feels a bit pointless, but it's harmless. While the first dance of deduction serves as a tutorial, and keeps you interested with its presentation, the second one does something different. This time, Susuto literally destroys all of Holmes' arguments. It's very fun to see because it's a complete 180 on the dynamic where Susuto just believes that Holmes is some incredible genius, and we also get to change Holmes' words here with evidence from the court record instead of looking around the room, so that's also a nice change of pace. Something else I really like is that Nika, Vina, and Biss' reactions are telegraphed very well. They react to information very strongly. An example of this is when Ryunosuke asks Nika Vina if she knows if anything crawled into the vent. She averts her eyes very quickly and starts to act suspicious. I like this. Yes, it's very easy to tell when the characters are lying, but it shows us something very important about these characters. They do feel guilty about what they did. 
you can get them to talk much more easily than a criminal who's simply trying to get away with the crime. The burden of proof in this case doesn't need to be anything crazy because one, we're not in a courtroom, and two, these are characters that feel bad and admit to what they do quicker than the average criminal. It also plays with the idea of observation that this game is obsessed with since a lot of the clues about this case are given via the body language of these characters. It's a very nice setup because we don't have to worry about the ridiculous standards of proof needed in most cases, so it flows better than most cases in the series by that fact alone. I also do like how investigations are much more streamlined. It's so easy to know what to do. Susudo tells you where you have to go if you get stuck, so you basically can't get lost. One of the problems with some of the earlier games was that it was very easy to get stuck in investigations. This just ruined the flow of cases and made the pacing of cases suffer. But here, you can easily know how to progress, so these blocks of doing nothing and wandering around won't exist. Also, everything you investigate is checkmarked, which narrows down what you have to investigate more easily. Now, I want to talk a bit more about the structure of the case. People don't really like how you don't get to do a lot because it's only an investigation. Despite this, I would argue that you get to do more here than you do in case 1. In case 1, there are cross-examinations and evidence prompts, but there aren't that many. Also, you can't get too ahead of the case. You can definitely figure out things before the game wants you to, but oftentimes, you will be limited because you haven't gotten a new piece of evidence that reveals more about the crime. So in episode 1, I found myself waiting for new pieces of evidence a lot of the time. However, with this episode, I felt like I was constantly learning new information about what happened. The first half of the case is where you just look at all the evidence and form some theories. Even though there isn't gameplay, I feel like I'm still playing the game because I'm always thinking about what might have happened by looking at my surroundings. The second half of the case is where you see if your theories are true. Many answers to questions you have are given here and you can change your theories based on new information that is given. I also like how you're limited to three investigation areas because they do so much in the small amount of space. I mean, there are so many plot threads in this case and they connect in very satisfying ways. We got the throbbing of the head, the locked room, the dying message, the chicken, the diary entries, the toppled books, the bell cord, the emergency button, the vent, and those are only a few of them. Even tiny things like the mousetrap, which don't even matter for the actual crime, still come into play for the story. And I just like how almost every object is used. And what's even crazier is that the events of the crime don't even feel that contrived. Everything has a good explanation for it. It may seem strange at first that the killer left half of the bell on the ground, but the fact that it was dark in the cabin is a plausible reason for how the killer missed it. It may seem weird that Cosmo died from a fall, but the combined factors of the ship, the cat, and Nikovina's push make it seem like it's actually possible. Even things like the random chance emergency stop have good explanations as we learn that Sholmes was the one who actually pressed the button. I also like how the identical rooms play off each other. When you investigate Cosma's cabin for the first time, you might come to the conclusion that someone physically toppled over the books. But once you investigate Nikovina's cabin and see the books in her cabin toppled over, you start to realize, hey, maybe the ship itself caused the books to topple over. And then you might think, hey, maybe the room got locked because of the ship as well. I've heard that some people don't like how some of the answers are just given to you. Like for the mystery of the locked room, the game just shows you how the locked room was made. I actually think this is a good thing. First, there's plenty of time to figure out how the locked room is made before they show it to you. And second, I think it's important to show that the locked room can be made that way so we can definitively say that the door will lock due to the emergency stop. Even if you thought of that beforehand, it's only a theory until the game shows you it's 100% possible. 
Also, I want to talk about how good the climax to this case is. So I'm talking about everything after the second dance of deduction. Nikavina confesses that the cat accidentally committed the crime, but everyone realizes that there has to be more to the story. And everything from this point on is just phenomenal. We learn more about Nikamina's past, and we understand why Stroganov is defending her so much. This part of the case feels more like a courtroom segment. Everything in this climax, including the second dance of deduction, is filled with gameplay. You get asked many questions, and you have to provide evidence for most of them. Sure, you don't have any cross-examinations, but I find that refreshing. I'll get into my thoughts about the cross-examinations in the next episode, but I do like the straightforward gameplay of just presenting evidence. It's very quick and straight to the point. I also love the story behind the incident. First, it touches on one of my favorite elements in the mystery genre, fear. Nika Vina was just so paranoid that she was misinterpreting things and acting irrationally. Remember how I said I love how everything in this episode connects very naturally? Well, Hosunaga's presence as the bodyguard connects here since inspector was the key word that scared Nikavina so much. And of course we have that final moment where we tell Nikavina what probably happened. It's a perfect integration of both story and gameplay. We point out that Cosmo is actually going to consult with Ryunosuke, making the case more tragic than it already was. I also do like how Ryunosuke doesn't feel too sympathetic for Nikavina and Biff, because his best friend did die, and the pair still try to get away with it. He does show some forgiveness at the end, but he makes sure that the two of them realize what they did. Something else I like about the crime is that it was an accident. If a main character dies, you'd expect the crime to be premeditated, and you'd expect that it would play a huge part in the story. The game even set it up like Cosmo's death was going to be very important. They talked about how he had some kind of mission, and then they brought up how Hosonaga was hired as a bodyguard by the Minister of Justice. This can definitely make you think that there's something of a larger scale going on here, that some higher power assassinated Cosmo or something. But the truth is, sometimes accidents can happen. I'm not even that big of a Cosmo fan, but I can't deny that this accident was impactful. This was a guy that had great ambitions. It was his lifelong dream to go to Britain. He even broke the rules to bring Ryunosuke with him, but all of that is gone now due to circumstances that could have easily been avoided. We also get some much needed dialogue from Ryunosuke and Susuto to see them grieving and getting over Kazuma's death. Hosunaga also joins and doesn't take away from the moment at all. Understandably, he feels guilty about what happened. And of course, we can't forget that this is the incident that sends Ryunosuke on his path to becoming a lawyer. His motivations are interesting. He wants to take on Cosmo's dreams without truly understanding what they are. We also get to see his resolve as he studies in such a short period of time. The payoffs here are also great with Cosmo's sword, Susuto accepting Ryunosuke as the lawyer of the trip, and Hosonaga coming in clutch at the end by getting the trip to work. It's an excellent conclusion to an excellent case. What can I say? Everything works. The character work is excellent. Not one character is even mediocre here. I think they're all fantastic. The mystery is fun and coherent, and the story elements are excellent as well. I give this one a 9 out of 10. It's phenomenal. There are very few things wrong here, and it's engaging throughout. I think this was a perfect first attempt at an investigation-only case. So yeah, it's actually quite shocking how amazing this case is. This is definitely a top-tier case for me. This would easily go into my top 10 Ace Attorney cases of all time. So with that done, next time, we will continue this adventure and land in Great Britain with the adventure of the Runaway Room. So, see you guys then.